Thank you for checking out this video. Our prayer is, is that this video helps us fulfill our mission of helping those that are far from God become committed followers of Christ all the way from the scenic city to the nations. While we think that this uh, video is a blessing, we don't want it to be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering together of saints and covenant community with other believers, other followers of Christ in a local body of believers in a church is what God created us and designed us to be, one body together. And so we pray this video will be a blessing to you. We pray it encourages you. We pray it challenges you, brings you closer to Jesus. But we don't want it to be a replacement for church. And so we encourage you to uh, go to a church that's close to you. And we would love for you to join us at Brainerd Baptist the next opportunity that you have. What a great day at Brainerd Baptist Church. Amen? Let me give you a recap of what's happened over the last few days, okay? Uh, on Wednesday, we gathered together as a church family, and we uh, celebrated Thanksgiving together. We enjoyed each other's company, and uh, we got some great news, multiple pieces of great news. The first one is that our senior pastor search team, as you've heard multiple times, I'm not sure what Aaron said to get the joke, but I was back there, didn't hear it. So whatever it was, it's good. Uh, it was reason uh, to celebrate that they are ready to present to our church Dr. Curtis Hill as our next senior pastor. And uh, we want you to be a part of that. And so follow all the stuff that Aaron told you to follow and be watching uh, to learn more about Dr. Hill. And so that'll be a great time. We also heard um, that we have had a goal of $450,000 for this month during harvest uh, time, season, day. And uh, we are now two weeks into the month and we have 200 and over $266,000 uh, towards that goal. Uh, we are excited about that. This Sunday and next Sunday, you can still be a part of that. If you haven't done it already, continue to be faithful uh, to give so that we can do what God's called us to do. This morning, uh, there were three kiddos that uh, professed their public profession of faith in front of our church. So Owen and Riley and uh, wait, there's one more, Hannah, all were baptized this morning. It was a great day. So if you're like on the edge and you're thinking, do I engage at Brainerd Baptist Church? Is there anything going on there? Listen, engage, be a part of this church family. It's worth being a part and you're going to be blessed because of it. And so this is a really good week. I also come into this week knowing that there are some of us that walk in here with a burden that's heavier than others. And so while everyone else is celebrating, we're in a time of mourning. The reason that we come to this place on this day, the reason that we put aside all of the distractions is so that we can hear from our Lord, so that we can sing praises to him, so that we can give worship back to him, so that we can walk out of here on his mission. And we come at particularly at this moment to hear from his voice. And we can hear that as the time that when we celebrate, we want to hear his voice. And when we come with burdens, we want to hear his voice. And today, we want to hear his voice from the book of Nehemiah. And so I'm going to lead us one more time in prayer, asking him that he would be with us. And then we're going to look at, at the book of Nehemiah. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I praise you for what you're doing in our church family. I pray, God, that you would just uh, explode that exponentially, that you would make much of yourself among us. And Lord, while so many of us celebrate, I also know that there are those of us who come with heavy burdens and grief. And I pray that for both of us, you would do us the blessing today, God, of allowing us to hear from you, to hear your voice through your word, God, that we would see through Nehemiah, God, how we are to follow after you. And so, Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you this time in your word. pray that you would bless it and use it. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you are a guest today and you're joining us, we have been walking through the book of Nehemiah. Last week, uh, I had a little health deal and Micah came in and you got a, a pause on Nehemiah. And so we're going to catch up just a little bit this morning. But we are preaching through this book. We are today in chapter number six. If you haven't been with us or you're trying to remember what this Nehemiah book is all about, here is the book in a sentence, okay? Nehemiah is ultimately a book about the restoration of God's witness, the witness of God's glory. A book about the restoration of the witness of God's glory. The restoration of God's witness, it takes place on two different storylines. 
The first storyline is the physical rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. The walls are going up. That's what Nehemiah's job is. He's left Persia from the king, and these walls are going up. The walls that are going up give testimony of the God of this city, the God who provides for the walls to be built. They give testimony to him. And the second storyline that we see in this book is the storyline of the spiritual rebuilding of the people of God in the city the way that they live their lives, the way that they give witness so that God would get glory by the way that they live out their lives. The restoration of God's witness of glory through a city and through a people. The story of Nehemiah, his life almost serves as a thread that weaves these two restoration storylines together into a common unified narrative. A narrative about a man who faithfully surrenders his life for the witness of God's glory to be restored so that all people would know his Lord. How? Here's what we've seen over the last couple weeks. Chapter 4, if you think back to it, what happened in chapter 4, we observed that despite opposition, the wall that's going up, the wall that Nehemiah is supervising, the wall that gives testimony to his Lord, that wall is halfway built. The people have worked with all of their hearts to get that wall uh, up, But opposition has come both from the outside and from the inside. The magnitude of the task of getting the next half up, it begins to weigh on the people. And as it weighs on the people, Nehemiah sees where they are. And Nehemiah says, remember the Lord. Remember the greatness of the Lord. Remember the awesomeness of the Lord. Remember who you work for. Remember whose witness we are restoring with each stone that goes on that wall. And as he reminded the people of that, Lord, rather than quit, they went to work on the wall. In chapter 5, we saw that the people, just like the wall, were only halfway restored. While many of the people had rallied and they were building faithfully, giving inch by inch for that wall to be restored, for the witness of the Lord to be restored, there were other people who were taking advantage of the workers. They were exploiting their sacrifices for their own gain. They were half-built people, people who had not been restored to be the witness that God wanted them to be. But the story of those people wasn't the story of Nehemiah. The story of Nehemiah's life, what we've seen through uh, five chapters and now six and seven chapters, is a story of a man willing to sacrifice himself, willing to give away his own privileges, not use what the king had even provided for him, and trusting in the Lord to see Nehemiah's faithfulness and to judge that faithfulness according to his, what he has, was doing for the will and the mission of the Lord. Nehemiah was faithful in the face of opposition. Opposition to the furtherance of God's glory comes from within and it comes from without. Opposition to God's will and his mission for us, it comes from all sides, inside and outside. Nehemiah's story is the story of faithfulness despite opposition. If you are a follower of Jesus today and you sit in this room and you hope to live your life on mission so that people see your God through your life, you need to be prepared for opposition. Opposition that will come from the outside, opposition that will come from the inside. And that leads us to the main point of what our passage will talk to us about today. God uses our faithfulness in the face of opposition as he accomplishes his purpose of making his glory known. I'll say that one more time. God uses our faithfulness, the way that we live our lives, our faithfulness to the Lord, in the face of opposition, both inside and outside, as he accomplishes his purpose of making his glory known. One of the things that we'll learn about faithfulness today in this passage is that faithfulness is more than just pushing forward. It's more than just working harder. It's more than just pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps. It's more than just persevering. Faithfulness in this way were ways that Nehemiah passed the test with flying colors. But faithfulness is also And maybe even more times reflected in our surrender, surrendering our own desires, our own hopes, our own dreams, 
surrendering those for God's greater glory. Jesus models that type of faithfulness when he prays in the garden before he goes to the cross. He prays to his father and he says, not my will, but your will be done. Paul personifies that as he writes to the church in Galatians and he says, I've been crucified with Christ. My life's already over. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In other words, everything I do, every decision I make is all determined by what brings God the greatest glory. Our culture will tell us today that surrender is something that's taken. We're told never give up. Surrender is what's taken from our cold, dead hands as they pry it out. But Scripture teaches us that true faith, truly following Jesus, instead requires complete and total surrender. Paul talks about this in the church to the church in Rome. He writes in chapter 12, verse 1, one that many of you have memorized. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do you want to worship your Lord today? Do you want to truly worship him? Do you want to know what it means to worship him in truth and, and, and feel it all to know him, to give him your all, to bring your offering to the Lord. Do you want to know what that looks like? It looks like giving and surrendering your life as a sacrifice for your Savior, completely surrendering to him, not because you have to, not because it's something that was taken from you unwillingly, but because it's something that you offer humbly for his glory. God uses our faithfulness in the face of opposition as he accomplishes his purpose of making his glory known. Let's begin today looking at Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. Remember, this is Nehemiah telling the story. He writes, When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, and the Arab, the Arab, And the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gap was left in it. Though at the time I had not finished the door, installed the doors in the city gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message, a message. Come, let's, let's meet together in the village of the Ono Valley. They were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing an important work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. Sam Ballot sent me this same message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and and Geshub agrees, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. This is the reason that you're building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf, there's a king in Judah. These rumors will be heard by the king, so come, let's let's confer together. Then I replied to him, there's nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You're inventing them in your own mind. For they were all trying to intimidate us, saying they will drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen my hands. The first thing that we'll see in this first few verses of of Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 9, is that Nehemiah surrendered his reputation for the witness of the gospel. Nehemiah surrendered his reputation for the witness of the gospel. Despite the opposition, both internal and external, from the enemies of the Lord, from his foes, there's no longer any gap in the wall. If you remember, this was a wall that was, it was broken down completely, completely destroyed, and now we read in this passage, there's no more gaps in the wall. The only thing that kept them from closing up the city, from closing all of the breaches that would allow, that would keep their enemies out was to install the doors and the gates. Once those doors and gates were set, 
The only option for the enemies of Nehemiah, the enemies of the Lord, if they wanted to take Jerusalem, if they wanted to keep Jerusalem and God's people under their thumb, the only option that they would have would be open military action. They could take siege of the city or they could go over the walls. But open military action, well, that probably would have been construed by the Persian Empire who sent Nehemiah there as an open act of war. They couldn't do that. They didn't want to fight with Persia. No, the last chance to put an end to God's people, the last chance to keep them down was to keep the doors from going up. But by now, Samballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and all the other enemies that we've heard about in our stories, they knew that the restoration of the wall, the key to the wall going up, they knew that the key to this, it wasn't the people It wasn't the resources, it wasn't the plan, the key to keeping the the walls from going up, the key to keep it from being completed was the leader, Nehemiah. Forget about sabotaging the gates, forget about burning the doors, forget about blocking the imports. If they wanted to stop the city from being closed, the city from being protected, the gates from being put into place, you've got to get rid of Nehemiah. The easiest way to get rid of Nehemiah was just to eliminate him, to assassinate him, to kill him. But even a fool knows you don't go and kill the king's cupbearer. No, it had to be subtle. It had to be a covert assassination. So they called a meeting. Come, meet with us, Nehemiah, in the, in the Ono Valley. Now, if Nehemiah would have made that journey, you can imagine what the report back to Jerusalem would have been. Dear Jerusalem, we are sorry to inform you of the unfortunate accident that occurred to our dear friend Nehemiah on his route between Jerusalem and Ono. Our beloved friend, he was tossed from his carriage, which amazingly landed upon him and burst into flames as he was on his way to visit us. Our condolences, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab. As one of my favorite pastors said, Nehemiah wisely said, oh no, to the meeting in oh no. Four times these men sent messages requesting him to come to the meeting, four times growing more and more desperate with each one, four times Nehemiah declines. He knew his actions would be used against him no matter whether he went or whether he didn't go, no matter how he responded. If he didn't go, he would be accused of being too good to meet with them. Maybe he would be accused of being intimidated by them or that he was embarrassed. He didn't know which fork to use at the table when he sat with these mighty men. The accusations would come if he didn't go. If Nehemiah had been trying to build his reputation, he should have went. This would have put him on level footing in the eyes of the people with these other leaders, the governors, the people who were in charge. He was asked and given a seat at the table. But Nehemiah, as we've seen throughout this book, he wasn't about guarding his reputation, and he wasn't about building a platform. He was about the task that God had given him of restoring his witness, God's witness, to the world. Nehemiah wasn't about a platform. Nehemiah wasn't about himself. He was about the wall. He was about faithfully giving of himself, faithfully working, faithfully surrendering his life so that the Lord's desire, the Lord's witness would go out to to all people. When Nehemiah's enemies saw the response to their request, they chose that rather than assassinate the man, they would assassinate his reputation. And so open letters in Nehemiah's day, as you read, the one that's sent by Sam Ballot's aide, they were the same as an open letter to the Wall Street Journal today. You see, the fifth open letter sent by Sam Ballot to Nehemiah, it wasn't actually for Nehemiah. It was directed to all those people who knew Nehemiah, who worked around Nehemiah, who knew who Nehemiah was. Its purpose was to inform the people of the real threat that Nehemiah was, the threat that he had been concealing from them all of this time as they labored so hard, that he had held the knife behind his back. They wanted to inform them about the real motives of the facade of Nehemiah's integrity. The letter that they sent open 
to the people in Jerusalem was that if the people followed Nehemiah, well, the king would interpret that as rebellion. God's people had already experienced this. They knew that with the wave of exiles that went back with Zerubbabel and the wave that went back with Ezra, at the king's word, the building of the wall could be stopped. At the king's word, the wall could be taken down. Again, all of their efforts lost. It was a threat. This is what happens if you find, follow Nehemiah. We'll tell the king. And Samballat warned that Nehemiah, he actually had motives that the people didn't know about. He was using them for his own sake. You see, Nehemiah was using the people because in reality he wanted to be the king. It couldn't be that he actually was a humble leader. No, he was a great manipulator. And he was using their work for his own good. Now, these were obviously lies. But if Samballot could convince the people that Nehemiah wasn't who he said he was, if he could poke holes in Nehemiah's reputation, Samballot might be able to get the people to stop working on the gates and on the walls. Nehemiah, hearing about the lies that were being spread about and the slander that was being infused to the people that he loved and that he was leading, he responded. He said, there's nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You're inventing them in your own mind, his response to Samballot. For they were trying to intimidate us, he says, saying that if they, they will drop their hands from the work and it will never be finished. It was an attempt at character assassination. We've all seen this happen to someone, haven't we? Many of us have experienced it. Someone's doing the right thing, but in doing the right thing, it impinges on the wrong person. And what ensues is the martyrdom of the person who's trying to do the right thing. You know, there's a reason that gossip columns keep papers alive. They've lasted from the time that papers were printed until the time of today when people don't even read papers. They just go online to read them. The gossip column always lives. It lives because people are hungry for gossip. They want to know the hidden motives that nobody else knows about. Maybe in our culture more than ever, we want to know the dirty secrets of our leaders, the dirty secrets of those who are out in front, secrets that are, whether they're based on truth or not, we want to know. It was pretty early in my ministry time that uh, something like this happened to me. There were some things that were said about me as a young guy in college, I was working in a church, and I wanted to respond. What people were saying, what this person was saying wasn't true. I wanted to set the record straight. I wanted to be vindicated. I wanted to justify myself. And a wise pastor put his arm around me, and he said, if I ever hoped to pastor and lead God's people, I would have to sacrifice my reputation, surrender it so that God could make much of who I was and what I did. He said, defend, he said, live above reproach. Trust the Lord to defend you. Focus on the task. Do what Nehemiah did. I'm certain that there are people in this room who have done the right thing. You've had people from the outside or maybe even worse from the inside who've come to you and they've, they've spread rumors about you. And what you want to do most is you want to guard your reputation. You want to stand, you want to stand up for yourself. You want to justify yourself. You want vindication. And what the Lord wants you to do is to surrender your reputation so that you can focus on his mission. Nehemiah acknowledged the slander. He exposed his purpose, and then he did something amazing. He put it in the Lord's hands, and he trusted the Lord with it. The witness of God's glory, you see, was more important than the slander against God's servant. Nehemiah surrendered his reputation for the witness of the gospel. He says, but now, Lord... After putting it in the Lord's hands, would you strengthen my hands so that the intimidation doesn't affect me and it doesn't affect the people? I want to be about the task that you've given me. Can that be said of us? Can it be said of me? Can it be said of you? Can it be said of our church? Can it be said of our families? Is God's witness more important than our reputation? Is God's 
glory, making him known? Is it more important what people believe about our Savior than it is about what they believe about us? Are we willing to surrender our reputation for the renown of our Savior? Are we willing to put our reputation in the Lord's hands and go to work just as Nehemiah did? We must surrender our reputation for the witness of the gospel. But that's not all that Nehemiah would have to surrender. Let's look at verses 10 through 14. I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Delaiah, son of Mahetabel, who was restricted to his house. He said, let's meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let's shut the doors to the temple because they're coming to kill you. They're coming to kill you tonight. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can someone like me enter the temple and live? I, I will not go. And I realized that God had not sent him because of the, promise, the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Samballot had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated, do as he suggested, sin and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. My God, remember Tobiah, Sanballat for what they have done. And also the prophetess, no idea, and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. It's not clear why Nehemiah went to the house of this false prophet, Shemaiah. Maybe he was respecting and deferring to a man who was supposed to be a man of God who spoke on behalf of God. But what is clear is that part of this, this meeting, was an orchestrated plan to take Nehemiah out, to set him up. Shemaiah's purpose was to sow fear in Nehemiah's heart. Here's what he said to Nehemiah again. He said, they're coming for you. Let's shut the doors to the temple. Come with me. It's a safe place. We'll hide. It's a, we'll, we'll find a hiding place. It'll all pass over. And once it's gone, we'll come back and we'll go back to the wall. What we see in verses 10 through 14 is that Nehemiah surrendered his fear for the witness of the gospel. Nehemiah realized that Tobiah and Sambalat had hired Shemaiah. They wanted to deliver a message that might strike fear in Nehemiah's heart. The people knew, the people knew, and Nehemiah knew, that people wanted to take his life. They wanted to take him out. They wanted to get rid of Nehemiah. And now here he sits at dinner with a prophet telling him that he would die. Not that he would die sometime, not that he would die soon, but that he would die tonight. Now most of us, if we received a death threat from our pastor who was bringing it on behalf of governors and leaders of our country saying, they're coming to get you tonight, most of us would run for the hills. We would look for a safe place. We would run and hide. We would find some way to make sure that we were safe. We would look for security, find security. But to go to a safe place for Nehemiah, would be to disobey the Lord. And that wasn't who Nehemiah was. To disobey the Lord would be to sin. It would be to ruin his reputation. It would be to discredit not just him, but his witness. And what we've learned about Nehemiah is, is that above all, God's greater glory is most important. The wall goes up for God's greater glory, for his witness, so that people would know his Lord. The people are restored for God's greater witness so that they would act in such a way that the world would know their Lord. Nehemiah's life would be spent, no matter what happened to it, so that people would know his Lord. What would Nehemiah do when the fear ran up his spine at the threat of his life? What would he do when the instincts of self-preservation went into overdrive, when all he wanted to do was to be safe, to find a safe, secure place? How would he respond? Nehemiah didn't run to hide in the temple. Nehemiah went to the wall. Nehemiah went about God's work for him. He was faithful. He persevered. He gave his all to the Lord. He said, should a man like me run away? 
How can someone like me enter into the temple and live? I will not go. Though fear overwhelms me, Nehemiah thinks. The witness of the gospel drives me. Psalm 23, I will fear no evil. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Paul writes, to live is Christ, to die is gain. My place, Nehemiah says, my purpose is on the wall so that people will know my Lord. I surrender my fear for the witness of the gospel. Come what may, I will be about the work of my Lord. Nehemiah's prayer, my God, Remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they have done, and also the prophetess, no idea, and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. In other words, Lord, I surrender my fear. I take up your mission. I trust you with those who would keep me from fulfilling what you want from my life. They would keep me from being faithful. You do with them what you want to do with them, but I am going to concern myself with what you want from me. When we surrender our fears... And we are faithful to the Lord. It's an offering of sacrifice and faithfulness to him. We have to ask ourselves, have we surrendered our fears today? The fears that keep us from faithfully following the Lord. Fears that keep us from truly worshiping him. Have we asked ourselves the question, have we laid down the fears that come from the personal consequences that may come from following Jesus, going wherever he calls us to go, doing whatever he calls us to do? Have you surrendered the consequences of what it may cost your family to follow Jesus, to go and do what his mission is for your family? Have you surrendered in your life the consequences of what it means to faithfully give your finances to the Lord? Have you surrendered today the consequences of what it means to lay your future and your dreams in God's hands and say, I'm yours? Have you surrendered today? Have you counted the cost? Have you looked at the magnitude of what God has called his people to do, of what he wants from you, that he doesn't want some, that he doesn't want most, but that he wants all. And have you laid it all in his hands? Have you surrendered your fear in order to follow your Lord? Nehemiah surrendered his fear for the witness of the gospel. Have we? For the witness of the gospel, we surrender our reputations. For the witness of the gospel, we surrender our fear. And that brings us to our last point. The result of surrender to the primacy of God's witness to the world is God's glory in the world. That's a complex sentence. I'm going to read it again. The result of surrender to the primacy of God's witness. That means that what God wants, his witness, is above every other thing. God's witness and his renown is way more important than any other thing in my life. That's the first question I answer when I make a decision. The result of surrender to the primacy of God's witness to the world is God's glory in the world. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 and 16. The wall was completed in 52 days. On the 25th day of the month of Elu, when all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. It's a pretty amazingly calm conclusion to this project, this building project, isn't it? A project that had seemed insurmountable, a project that they would never be able to complete with workers, that they would never, that would didn't have the power, the strength to do it. And all that we see is in verse number 15, the wall was completed in 52 days. Despite opposition, internal and external, from its beginning to its completion, 52 days. Setting those gates in place, you can almost hear them as they fail, clunk, clunk, 
clunk, these giant gates falling into place, each one serving like an exclamation point to God's proclamation of who he was, his witness to the world through the gates falling into place, doing something that no one thought that these people could do. When the enemy heard the gates were set, they were intimidated. Maybe a better translation is they were left in awe. They were not in awe of the resources that were used. They were not in awe of the project management system that Nehemiah had used. They were not in awe of his motivational speeches. They were not in awe even of the leadership skills that he had demonstrated or of the speed of the work. What left them in awe, what intimidated them, which they had tried to do to God's people over and over four times in this chapter, a goal of intimidating Nehemiah and his people. They were left intimidated and in awe themselves by what God had done. Now, if you're reading a translation other than the CSB today, you may be missing the best translation for verse number 16. CSB didn't pay me to make this statement, and it's not always the best translation. But in this case, the work was accomplished by our God. By our God. Not with our God, not with the help of our God. What was done was done by our God. It was God who did the work. And it was God who would get the credit. Several years ago, when Laura and I went to the mission field, we went to a city with 13 million people. We went with limited resources, limited uh, teammates, limited uh, language, limited. The only thing that we had that was, that was unlimited was limits. And uh, that's kind of who we were. We went with an insurmountable task to try to share the gospel, plant churches in this giant city. And as we began to pray about what God would, how, how can we even pray well for this place? We asked the Lord, would you just give us one prayer that we can pray that will help us know how we do this? A prayer that God would always answer. And the prayer that we began to pray decades ago, and if the Lord will allow, we'll continue to pray for more decades to come, is that God would do something so great, so awesome, so mighty through the limited sacrifice that we can give that only he would get the credit for what he does. The surrender of our lives would render such a witness that people would never be confused by who did the ministry. Today, all of us have an insurmountable task, a task of making Christ known among all peoples, nations, tribes, and tongues, a witness that needs to be true so that when people see... God's people, that they see our God. Can we pray that prayer together today? It's the prayer of our lives that God would set us aside and make much of himself with who we are. Is God's glory primary to who we are? Every decision we make, everything that we do, is God primary? We'll see in the coming verses that just because God accomplished the task of restoring his witness through the completion of these rebuilt walls, the opposition didn't go away for Nehemiah and God's people. Tobiah was working behind the scenes to continue trying to intimidate Nehemiah. We see that in verses 17 through 19. During those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, since he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Era, and his son Jehoahan had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. These nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. There's a lot that could be said here about Tobiah. Tobiah had many people within the city, within God's people that were loyal to him. They had sworn oaths to him, probably both financial and social. Nehemiah was a man of principle, a man of purpose, a man who didn't compromise. Nehemiah was someone, as we've seen throughout this book, that he was committed to do and to obey God's word, to be about God's purpose. The people knew that by now. But they came to Nehemiah, and they wanted to tell him what a good guy Tobiah was. He's a good guy. Well, even though for all that slander that he said about you and about God's people, he's, 
He's a good guy, Nehemiah. Tobiah, Tobiah, he, uh, you know, even though that he got, you know, he's been trying to keep God's purpose from being fulfilled, you know, he is still a really, at heart, he's a great guy. The nobles said that it would be in the best interest of God's people. Well, at least the best interest of the nobles to stay in the good graces of Tobiah. Meanwhile, Tobiah kept sending his letters of intimidation to Nehemiah. We can all imagine what these letters said, letters that probably many of us have heard. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I'm friends with? You know the nobles? They belong to me, Nehemiah. They're faithful to me. I've got their oaths written. What would happen if I turned those nobles against you, Nehemiah? Earlier, Tobiah and his friends had mocked Nehemiah in chapter 4. You'll remember they started making jokes about that half-built wall. Tobiah was the one that said, even if a fox climbs up on that wall, the whole thing will come down. Sanballat, his buddy, had laughed, and he said, what are they going to do next? Offer sacrifices? Are they going to worship again? They mocked Nehemiah. They mocked God's people. They mocked God himself. They said the people of Jerusalem... Those weak people, they're never going to fulfill God's plan. They're never going to worship again. That's a ridiculous idea. Are you kidding me? That could never happen. Only God could do something like that. A city rebuilt, worship restored. (laughs) That'll never happen. Chapter 7, verse 1. When the wall had been rebuilt... And I had the doors installed. The gatekeepers, singers, and Levites were appointed. What was this story about again? Rebuilding a city and rebuilding a people for the purpose of making God's glory known? Restoring worship and mission to God's people? Chapter 7 concludes the story of the city rebuilt. The gates are in their place. God's enemies are intimidated. And now Nehemiah sets the final pieces in place that would be necessary for rebuilding God's people, for bringing them back to worship again. If we were to read all of chapter 7, this is what we would read. We would read that Nehemiah put in place a faithful leader in charge that would govern the city. We would read that singers and Levitical priests, temple servants... They were brought in by Nehemiah, and Nehemiah made sure that each one fell fell in line, that they were qualified before they led worship. Any unqualified, they're off the worship team. We would read, if we continued chapter 7, that the church role was updated, that a launch service was announced. We would hear, if we continued to read, that an offering was taken. And next week, we'll see a people return to worship. But this morning... I think we need to be reminded of this. God uses our faithfulness, your faithfulness, my faithfulness, when we face opposition as he accomplishes his purpose of making his glory known. Faithfulness in the face of opposition, it oftentimes looks like surrendering ourselves as an act of worship to the Lord. Not our worship being taken from us, but our worship being given to him. We surrender our reputations, what people think and say about us, because all that matters is the reputation of our Lord. He is the one who will judge our actions and our hearts. If we're followers of Jesus, we surrender our fear. What could happen to us if we're obedient? What it may cost us if we go go where God calls us to go and do what God calls calls us to do. We trust the Lord with our lives and we lay aside our fears so that we can give ourselves to his purpose for our life. The result of our surrender to the primacy of God's witness to the world will be God's witness in the world. Allow me to close with a question. What if the greatest issue that hinders the witness of the gospel from being known among all people is in fact not the opposition on the outside or the opposition 
on the inside. What if the greatest hindrance is not opposition from the outside or opposition from the inside, but rather it is the unwillingness of believers, families, and churches to surrender their reputation, their fear, and their all for the witness of the gospel? What if that is what keeps the Lord's name from being known among all people? What if it's not the opposition? What if it's us? An unwillingness to die to ourselves, to offer our lives as a sacrifice for our king. What if he's not known because of us? Can we sing the song, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give, I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Let's pray together. Lord, we surrender all. We surrender all, Lord, because you are worth it all. Lord, I ask you that anyone sitting in this room today who hasn't followed you by the first time of giving their all to you and making you their Lord, I ask, Lord, that they wouldn't leave this place the same as they walked in. I pray, Lord, for brothers and sisters who are followers of you, but they're holding on to things, Lord, that you're not Lord over. And I ask you, Father, you give them the courage, Lord, to lay down their reputation and lay down their fear and to give you their all so that through their lives, Lord, you can have them be a witness, Lord, among all peoples. Lord, the heart of this book of Nehemiah is that the world would know who you are and worship you accordingly. The heart of our application at Brainerd Baptist Church in our families and in our personal lives is that our lives would live, we would live our lives in such a way that your renown would be made known, that your name would be worshiped. God, may that be. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.